Hello and welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Eleanor Barrett. In this episode, we'll be looking at what the future holds for gun rights and gun control in the United States. With us to walk through current gun laws and the debates that surround them is Kermit Roosevelt, a professor of law here at Penn Law. He's also a fiction author and has most recently written the novel Allegiance. Thank you for joining us. The horrific June shootings in Orlando are just the latest and deadliest in a series of gun-related mass violence here in the United States. And debates are raging about gun control. Um, to get us started on this conversation, can you please give us an overview of what federal laws regulate gun possession here in the United States? Well, there are a bunch of federal laws out there. And they regulate, basically, who can own guns, they regulate the process by which guns are sold, and they regulate the kinds of guns that can be possessed. So there is, for instance, a federal ban on machine guns. There was, for a while, a ban on semi-automatic rifles and large capacity magazines, although that expired. Um, there's a federally required background check, and there are federal prohibitions on gun ownership by people who've been convicted of felonies and also misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence and some other, some other categories of people who are excluded from gun ownership. So those are all federal laws, but what's happening at the state level? There seems to be some variation. For instance, Hawaii seems to have very strict laws versus other states like Arizona that have much more lenient laws, and how much does that affect um, the restrictions that govern gun, gun ownership? There's a lot of variation in state laws, and in part that's how our system of federalism is supposed to work. Different states can experiment with different policies. We'll see which works best, and maybe that will be adopted by all the states in the long run. So states have different laws about conditions under which concealed carry permits will be issued. They have different laws about background checks and waiting periods. And in general, they regulate much the same topics as the federal government does, who can own guns, what you have to do to buy one, but uh, they do so um, in a diverse way. Well, the heart of the issue, of course, uh, whenever this comes up, is the Second Amendment. And so can you explain to us just a little bit about what that is and then give us your take on it as well? Well, the Second Amendment, um, or I would say the right to bear arms, is actually a very complicated topic, I think. And it's sort of fascinating because it, it shows you a lot about our constitutional history. And also, I think it shows you a lot about the way our, our political process works. But to start with, there's the Second Amendment itself, which is part of the Bill of Rights. It's ratified in 1791. It applies to the federal government and not the states. Um, and that's an amendment where we know what its purpose was, because it tells us that in the preamble. It says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. So it is about preserving state militias. Um, it's about preserving state militias as a military counterweight to the federal government. So the idea there is the lesson of the revolution is that the general government, which in the revolutionary period was the British Empire, and after the ratification of the Constitution is the federal government, is maybe going to be a threat to the liberty of its citizens. It's maybe going to become a tyrant. And if that happens, this is what happened in the revolution, the hope of the drafters of the Second Amendment was the state militias will stand up and protect the liberty of their citizens. They're going to fight off the federal army. Mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of things to say about that. One of the debates was, does this mean that there's an individual right to own guns or just a right that's sort of possessed by the states? And the Supreme Court recently said it is an individual right. They didn't disagree with the idea that the purpose is to protect state militias, but they said the way the drafters intended to do that was to protect this individual right. The other questions that you could ask about the Second Amendment are sort of, has it succeeded? Could it meaningfully fulfill its purpose? And based on those questions, what kind of regulations should we allow? You know, what kind of regulations won't undermine the purpose? And the answer there, I think, is very interesting because the answer to the first question is probably there's no way it can fulfill its purpose. Um, it's just not the case that the states could field a military force that would fight off the federal government. Now, is that this because is, of the size of the federal? armed forces or well, because yeah, of the asymmetry between the two organizations? Why is that? Well, we now have a federal standing army that's pretty big. So it's much larger right. than the forces that the states could put in the field right now. And military technology has evolved so much mm -hmm. that the federal army is much more powerful on a you know person for person basis sure. than state forces because they've got better weapons. They've got tanks. They've got planes. In the Founders' Day, you know, 
the Federal Army, the Redcoats, would go out there with their guns, which is basically what they had, and then the militia would oppose them with their guns. And it was a relatively even contest there. So you didn't have tanks, you didn't have airplanes, and so on. So you know, one thing to say about the Second Amendment is there's, there's really no way it can fulfill its original purpose. The other thing, though, is that didn't always used to be the case, right? It used to be sort of a closer question. And we sort of tried it. So what is the Second Amendment designed to produce? It's designed to produce something like the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So why does the Civil War start? It's because some states are afraid that the federal government is going to take away the rights of their citizens, the rights that they believe the Constitution guarantees. Um, in that case, of course, it's the right to own slaves. But if you think about it more generally, this is how the Second Amendment is supposed to work. The federal government threatens people's rights. The states stand up to defend them. And actually, from the perspective of the Second Amendment, the South is supposed to win the Civil War. So we tried it. It didn't really work. Right. Right? Civil War didn't work out so well. Um, and there's no way now that the amendment's original purpose can be fulfilled. And what I think that means, and I'm still just talking about federal regulation here, what I think that means is that if we're asking what kind of regulation of the right to bear arms is permissible, it would make sense to ask, as we do with most other constitutional provisions, what kind of regulation is going to stop this amendment from doing what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So the First Amendment, for instance, it's supposed to allow people to freely discuss political matters so that they can make decisions about self-government. So we allow regulations that don't undermine that goal. We allow restrictions on volume of sound trucks and things like that. So with the Second Amendment, I think most of the restrictions that people are, are suggesting um, really don't threaten that goal. And that's in part because there's, there's no way the goal can be achieved. So I guess that's the crux of the debate now, right, is what kinds of restrictions on the, on the right to bear arms, which, as you've said, is now yes. interpreted to be an individual right, are permissible in light of uh, the Second Amendment. And it sounds like there's one argument that um, these restrictions don't have anything to do with the goal. But what is the crux of the way that courts look at this question now? Well, another point that I think is, is very important to make is that the Second Amendment gets invoked in our political conversations in a way that's totally out of proportion to what the courts have actually done with it. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear people say, oh, you know, I support expanded background checks, but unfortunately the Second Amendment doesn't allow that. And that's just clearly not true. So what has the Supreme Court said? It said the Second Amendment protects an individual right. Mm -hmm. And it said that means there are some limits on what the government can do. But the only gun control laws that the Supreme Court has struck down under the Second Amendment are basically total bans on the possession of handguns in the home. So sort of the core of what you might think of as a right to self-defense. So it's not the case that the Second Amendment individual right, supposing you accept that, which you know the Supreme Court has said it's an individual right, it's not the case that the Second Amendment individual right is absolute. In fact, none of our constitutional rights are absolute. Going back to the First Amendment, you could look, for example, at people who were burning draft cards in protest of the Vietnam War. That's core political speech, political expression. It's at the heart of the First Amendment. Nonetheless, Congress was allowed to ban that. So certainly there are some regulations that are permissible. And in fact, an interesting thing about the Second Amendment is it actually says a well-regulated militia. So the Second Amendment itself contemplates regulations mm -hmm. of these armed forces. But all of this is just about the federal Second Amendment. And when you get to the right to bear arms that protects you from state regulation, interestingly, I think we're talking about a very different thing. So the Second Amendment, the Federal Second Amendment, comes from the revolutionary understanding of the way government works, which is the federal government threatens liberty and the states protect it. When we're talking about the right to bear arms against the states, that comes through the 14th Amendment, which is after the Civil War. It's after Reconstruction. It's during Reconstruction. And the, the drafters of that amendment have a very different understanding of the relationship between the states, the federal government, and the citizens. In particular, they're thinking the states are oppressing people. The federal government can protect liberty. And what are they concerned about with the right to bear arms? Because they actually were concerned about it. You can find this in the debates of the Reconstruction Congress. What they're concerned about is that the states are failing to protect some people, notably the freed slaves, from private violence, from violence at the hands of the Klan and the Knight Riders.
So their idea there is the right to bear arms is important to allow people to protect themselves when the state doesn't do so adequately. So there, I think it's pretty clear um, this is a right, it's not tied to state militias, right? The Reconstruction sure. Congress doesn't like state militias. Those are the people they just sure. beat in the, in the military contest. It actually is pretty clearly an individual right that's more focused around self-defense. Well, so you mentioned before when we were talking about restrictions that people often invoke the Second Amendment in the context of political discussions. And there has been, in fact, a lot of politics around this, even recently in the wake of the Orlando shootings. And, and in fact, this month, four proposals failed in Congress. Um, do you think that there's going to be any progress on this issue, on the issue of gun restrictions in Congress in the near future? Is there any compromise possible or is there any... Uh, regulation that's possible, given you know what you've discussed, but also the political reality. Well, so what I've said so far is I don't think the Second Amendment is a barrier to most sure. of what's being proposed. Um, what is a barrier is the way that our political process works. And in particular, the analysis of this that I find persuasive is that there's an intensity gap. So if you poll the American public, a large majority supports various kinds of gun restrictions. Um, but that's a diffuse group. You know, they're not acting in concert very effectively. It and may not for most be people, the most intense issue for them. Yeah, it may for be most one people, of many issues it's a relatively low priority. Sure. But then you've got a smaller group, which is the NRA and its supporters, and they are very, very intensely focused. So you've got what people call an intensity gap, which is one of the ways that democratic politics can actually fail to reflect the will of the majority. Um, a small but intensely focused interest group can exert more pressure on legislators than this diffuse, less focused majority. So one way in which you might actually get progress would be if there was an equally focused interest group that came up against the NRA. And I've seen some suggestions that after Orlando, maybe gun control will start to be seen as a gay rights issue. Mm -hmm. And you could get the LGBT groups organizing, and they would have the same kind of focused advocacy. And then if you've got interest group versus interest group, you're more likely to get an outcome that reflects the will of the majority. Well, why haven't there been other um interest groups that, I mean, it sounds like there's some suggestion that there would be some starting up after Orlando, but why haven't, I mean, I think there's been, Mike Bloomberg, for instance, has has said that he's going to fund something like this. Why haven't those efforts worked as much? Is it just because of the lack of intensity of this issue on the other side? Yeah, I think the lack of intensity explains most of this, because guns kill a lot of people. Cars kill a lot of people. Um, sugar kills a lot of people. It turns out, right, it's more sugar than fat, right. we think now. Heart disease, cancer. Um, there are lots of things that people might want to fix about the world. And gun killings have sort of high salience because they scare people. Um, it's like a horrifying way to die. It's out of your control. People fear that much more than they fear heart disease. But it just doesn't provoke the same kind of focus on one side that it does on the other. The Supreme Court just issued a decision in Voisin versus the United States that's been reported in the press as having some relevance to this topic. Could you explain that and how does it bear on the, the idea of gun rights and gun control? Well, I think it, it does have some relevance. So that's about a law, one of the ones I mentioned before, a federal law that prohibits people convicted of misdemeanor crimes of domestic violence from possessing firearms. And the question that the Supreme Court was addressing was, does it have to be a crime that requires that you intended to inflict an injury on someone, or can it be that you were reckless? So what's the required state of mind here to trigger this firearm disability? And the Supreme Court said recklessness is enough. Which, you know, for one thing, well, it expands the category of people who are subject to this ban, so that's relevant to what we're talking about. But I think the more important thing is here's a law that takes away your right to own guns for something that maybe you didn't even intend to do. You didn't even do it on purpose. You, you know, you disregarded a substantial risk. Um, and who thinks the Second Amendment is a problem? No one, right? No one says this is unconstitutional. Justice Thomas is the only justice who says it raises a constitutional question. Mm -hmm. So eight members of the Supreme Court dealing with this gun control law that takes away your right to own guns, right? That's a complete ban on ownership for these people for something they didn't even necessarily do intentionally. They don't think that there's a sufficient constitutional question to even warrant discussion or even warrant reading the statute differently to avoid it.
Does that, is this case, do you think, promising for future gun regulations, or is it sort of a, its own island because it deals with this specific issue of criminal intent? Well, I think what it illustrates is the point that the Second Amendment is not the problem, which is the main point I was, I was trying to suggest earlier. The Second Amendment does not, as it has been interpreted by the Supreme Court, prohibit the kinds of gun regulations that most people are talking about. And that was true even when Scalia was on the court, um, the Supreme Court turned down a whole bunch of challenges to gun control laws, even with Scalia on the court. And obviously, it's even more true mm -hmm. with Scalia off the court. And if, as I would say seems likely, a Democrat appoints Scalia's replacement, then there's really no chance that the court is going to push ahead aggressively with its Second Amendment interpretation. Sure. Another topic that's come up um, in the wake of uh, gun violence is the discussion about how uh, the Centers for Disease Control doesn't even conduct any research about gun violence and its effects. Um, I think there was a video maybe of President Obama talking about how we research car accidents that cause death, but we don't research gun violence. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And are there any prospects for future research by the Centers for Disease Control or another federal agency to figure out how we can stop gun violence? Well, what President Obama said is true. You know, most consumer products out there are investigated for their safety. If they're causing deaths, we try to figure out how to reduce it. Mm -hmm. If you look at cars, the federal government requires people to um, observe certain safety standards when they're manufacturing cars, so we regulate the design of cars. Um, with guns, however, what have we done? A federal law that I didn't mention before actually shields gun manufacturers from design defect lawsuits. So you can sue someone if you're injured in a car accident saying this car was designed in an unreasonably dangerous manner, right? You could have made it safer, I wouldn't have been hurt. But you can't sue a gun manufacturer to say this gun was designed unreasonably um, unless it like blows up and injures the shooter. Mm -hmm. For guns that kill people, that kill lots of people because they don't have you know, restrictions on how fast they can shoot or magazine restrictions. You can't bring that kind of suit because of federal law. So with just about every other product, the federal government is going in there and saying, let's study this, how can we make it safer? And it's issuing regulations saying, manufacturers, you have to do these things. Um, our position on guns is exactly the opposite. Now, why is that? So it's, it's been pointed out that the law that governs the CDC is not a complete ban on research. What the CDC is prohibited from doing is advocating for gun control. Mm -hmm. But this has been interpreted, and I think reasonably, by all of the scientists and the CDC officials as meaning if you do a study and it suggests that guns could be safer, then you are advocating for gun control and you're in violation of the statute and bad things will happen to you. So it's generally understood in the scientific community I think that any sort of research that casts doubt on the NRA's positions is going to be met with political pushback. So again, this is a, this is a political problem. OK. Um, and so there doesn't seem to be any prospect for change other than through amending the legislation that governs the CDC. And it sounds like maybe also changing some of the legislation that governs what gun manufacturers can be held liable for. Yeah, changing the, the legislation that governs the CDC would be a significant step forward, I think. And the American Medical Association has started lobbying for this. So there again, I think it's a good sign you've got a powerful interest group on the other side now. So it's possible that we'll see changes there. Okay. Um, and now looking ahead, what role do legal scholars have to play in this debate uh, about gun control, gun regulation, as well as um, maybe any future uh, political changes that have in this area? Well, on the whole, I think the role of legal scholars is relatively minor. So, you know, you ask, what's the role of legal scholars in reducing car fatalities? Sure. What's the role of legal scholars in um, making consumer products safer? I think legal scholars can analyze the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. I believe that properly understood the Second Amendment actually doesn't have that much in the way of restrictions on what the government can do here particularly the federal government. I think legal scholars or political scholars can analyze the political process to tell us why we're getting results that go against the will of a large majority of the American people. But really, I think this is more an area for medical epidemiologists, for consumer product safety people. Um, it's not a constitutional problem. It's a political problem. And then it's a scientific problem. It's a public health problem. Thank you again for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Case in Point.